Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 State of the Shell. I'm Joey Aiello, and I'm joined here by technical fellow and PowerShell inventor Jeffrey Snover. How are you doing today, Jeffrey? I'm fantastic. How about you, Joey? I'm doing wonderful. I can't wait to show off all the awesome stuff we've been working on. I'm really excited to be back here, uh, obviously in a virtual capacity, but for uh, PowerShell DevOps and Global Summit 2021, it's so nice to be uh be be back in business here. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait to uh, do this again next year when maybe we can all be in person. But, but we did had such a great year. Can't wait to tell people about it. So, absolutely. So slides? let's get into it. Yeah, we're just going to go ahead and get this uh, get this deck thrown up here. And here we are. State of the Shell 2021. Ooh ha. Okay, well, let me take control here a second. So, yeah, so, so are we there yet? You know, Joey, when, um, when we were doing, you weren't around at the time, but we had just finished PowerShell version two and shipped it, and we're beginning planning for PowerShell version three. And one of the execs is like, PowerShell version three? What the heck are you doing that for? Aren't we done with that thing? <laughs> And so, you know, I think uh, one of the questions is, hey, you know, we've been working on this for about 20 years. Are we there yet? Like, is there any more juice left in the squeeze? And and, I, and the answer is absolutely, yeah. You know, well, absolutely, there's a lot more juice left in the squeeze. You know, I like to joke about Lee, uh, you know, Lee Holmes, right? And I say, well, you know, Lee's like the consummate hacker, like in the good MIT sense of the word, right? And that, you know, if you give that guy some WD-40 and some duct tape, he can solve any problem in the world, right? But it requires a lot of energy, right? Um, but if you gave him a wrench, he could solve any problem in the world and it'll be, be a little bit easier. And then if you gave him a saw, same thing. So with PowerShell version three, right, you could do everything you could do with PowerShell version three, you could do with PowerShell version one. It just required a lot more energy. And, you know, it's one of those things, I don't know if I've talked to you about this, but one of the things that has really been forming my concept of, of the computing industry in large um, and just simplifies everything is this idea of energy per answer. How much energy does it take to produce an answer? How much human energy does it take to achieve a result? And then how much computational energy does it help, does it require to do that? I like and that. I think when you pull on that thread, everything could become simpler. And so what you see is through each subsequent version, you know, version seven, we, or when we went cross platform, all of a sudden there were things you could do like run on Linux that you couldn't do before. But on Windows, there's nothing you can't do with version seven that you couldn't do with PowerShell version one, just required a lot more energy. So what are we going to talk about? Yeah. So, you know, like you said, you know, it's, it's all about making things easier. And to that end, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about PowerShell seven, the journey that we kind of went through to get up to this point uh, in simplifying and, and reducing that energy per answer for, for PowerShell customers, uh, sort of principles uh, that we're following that are guiding our development of PowerShell seven. Some of the data, uh, usage data, in terms of you know how people are using PowerShell 7 today, and just whether or not uh, those principles have really been uh, uh, met with with real world experience, and then obviously the the release aspect here of of PowerShell 7.1 and 7.2. After that, we're going to talk a little bit about open source working groups, uh, sort of changes in the governance of our open source projects. We'll get into a new project here, PS Arm, uh, which is a, a really awesome module for uh, helping you build Azure Resource Manager templates. Uh, and then we're going to tease a little bit of the uh, predictive IntelliSense and PS read line improvements that uh, are, are going to be presented on uh, later in the conference. Uh, just give you a little teaser there and uh, and then a little bit of bonus uh, there as well at the end that we'll, uh, we'll save for a surprise. Yeah, that's so much cool stuff. Yeah, so let me talk about this, uh, you know, Monet Manifesto, right? Well, sorry, about this book. You know, I don't know if you've read, Joey, have you read the book? I was just lamenting that I have not. I've, I've read a couple passages from it, but I really need to set aside some time and read it because I, I hear it's just chock full of uh, awesome tidbits. It is. You know, Don Jones reached out and I was able to connect him with a bunch of the original PowerShell team. And he wrote the story about how PowerShell came about. We've talked about various episodes of that, but he was able to get the view from everybody to uh, put into the book. And so it's a fantastic read. And so here I'm going to talk about the, the different uh, uh, phases of PowerShell, right? So first there was the manifesto and uh, the previews from 2002, 2005. And I would say that, the, you know, my, what I believe is my core contribution to PowerShell was in these early days. Days, establishing a framework where we could get this collection of geniuses together and have their IQs add up, right? Bill always used to say, hey, we're great at finding really smart people and hiring them. We just suck at getting their IQs to add up. 
So establishing the architectural principles, the design goal, the spirit, the ethos, the culture, uh, then we're able to bring in these awesome people. And the thing I love about the story is, uh, about the book, is it's able to tell the stories of these geniuses and what they brought to the table in full detail. So then we shipped and we had PowerShell version one, or that was to say Windows PowerShell version one and two. And this is where we did, you know, Windows management and you could bridge APIs, right? You could talk to .NET, you could talk to COM, you could talk to WMI, you know, the, that's the heart of PowerShell. The reason why we had to invent PowerShell was because unlike Linux, where everything is file oriented, and if you can edit a file and restart a process, you can manage everything. In Windows, everything's behind an API. And so you needed to talk to those APIs and you need to have the right admin uh, abstraction for talking to APIs. And so that's what we did in, in PowerShell version one and two. So, so going back to your original analogy then, Jeffrey, you know, these, these APIs are essentially your WD-40 and duct tape, right? Yes, exactly, exactly, yeah. And if you've ever tried to like actually do anything by talking to the WMI uh, objects, <laughs> you'll know exactly what we're talking about. Like, okay, I can do that, but what, what, what? And in fact, PowerShell version three was when we had that kind of critical mass. And it turns out that the bulk of those commandlets were written in WMI. Right? But now all of a sudden, I can say get disk, I can say get TPM, uh, and have these nice abstractions, but underneath the covers is all that crazy WMI stuff. Okay, uh, And so we just, you know, from three to five was where we just went and got critical mass, critical mass, critical mass, more and more coverage, more and more. So this is, I think, when we shipped, we had like 120 commandlets, but by the time we had PowerShell version three, there were over 1,200 commandlets. So re really crazy coverage. Then with PowerShell 6, this is when we use, you know, sort of like sometimes to go forward, you have to go backwards. So what we did was, hey, we know that we want to go forwards. We want to be cross-platform. And to do that, we had to do .NET Core. And I'll tell you, boy, the team really took one on the chin going to .NET Core. We effectively had to throw away, what was it, it was about 10 years worth of of tests that we had to rewrite from scratch. I mean, that was that was freaking brutal. And then we had to do all this hard work because you know, we're being honest, you know, .NET Core, they were too courageous in their refactoring of version one and they got the memo and have since fixed that. But we stuck with it. You know, there were very few people that were successful with .NET Core version one and we were, and that was just through pure bloody mindedness. Like we, we were back to WD-40 and duct tape, right? We started, <laughs> we started over in the Linux world and it was like, uh, it was like we got thrust, you know, through those doors and, and, you know, here are your tools now. Right. So, uh, no, that's exactly but, it. You know. Yeah. Right. And so, and so there, and so people used it as great as cross platform, but on windows, it was less. You know, and so that's why we had Windows PowerShell and you had PowerShell Core. And PowerShell Core on Windows was really less than Windows PowerShell. But then, hallelujah, PowerShell 7, right? PowerShell 7 is the one release to rule them all, right? Like Lord of the, like the, the ring, right? It's in, and this is really that the, the release that empowers every person and organization to achieve more. So every person, you know, that's our company mission, right? But as applied to PowerShell, it's really true. Every operating system, every cloud, well, every, every operating system that matters. We didn't port to o Amiga OS, we didn't port to VMS, but you know the Linuxes and the and the and the Windows shells. I, I do remember having a conversation uh, early days, pre pre six alpha, where we were talking about whether AIX support was going to be important. So. Uh... It's, uh, yeah, we, we, we considered everything out there. Well, right. I remember, I think we even now uh, run on Photon, but I remember you know, like yes. the VMware guy yes, saying, VMware hey, yeah. you want to support Photon? I'm like, what's a Photon? What? Is it? what? Right. And it turns yeah. Out, yeah. And they helped us with that. So it works great. Yeah, it's crazy. And then there's Alpine. I mean, there are all these releases. Oh, I love Alpine. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm running that one on all my Raspberry Pis at home. It's great oh, for that local. Oh, is that an ARM one? Yeah. Well, they, they got everything, but yeah, it's very, very tiny Alpine. Very, very Fantastic. tiny. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, what are our principles here? So again, PowerShell 7, empower every person and organization to achieve more, also known as manage anything, anywhere, right? So one, cross cloud, cross, you know, our on-premises. So what's that mean? So we start off, I can manage this OS. And yes, I can manage this OS or that remote OS, and whether that's Windows or Linux, but now I can manage, you know, any of the workloads, and now you can manage any of the clouds. I was so excited with when we did uh, PowerShell 6, or dot that six. Yeah, wait, wait. Power, well, we had the our, our our launch partners were Google, AWS, and VMware. I mean, that just to me, uh, I 
I'm just kind of well up now thinking about it. Like we are truly open. The fact that these people were not really what you consider traditional Microsoft friends looked at this opportunity and sort of said, hey, you know, should I, what? And then they looked and was like, yeah, I'm in. And uh, they were across platforms. So now this tool can work. AWS, Google, uh, us, VMware, manage anything, whether it's Windows, Linux, Mac OS, no VMS. Let me know if that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Windows compatibility, remember, it was less, but with 7, it's not less anymore. So there's a couple reasons for that. One is .NET 3.1. I told you they were overly courageous with their refactoring. .NET 3.1 really raised the compatibility bar. They were very, very compatible, lots of coverage for APIs that weren't there before. But then we also added something we call WPS Compat Session, which basically says, Hey, if there's something that it still doesn't even run in .NET Core 3.1 or somebody hasn't done the work to say that it does, what we'll do is, you know, like, remember I said you could run a command like get TPM and you run it here, but it's actually running in WMI. Well, here, it's the same thing. You run the commands and what we do underneath the covers is we create a, rem a local remoting session to a PowerShell uh, V5 version and we run it there and and have a proxy command here so now you get just fantastic compatibility uh, and by the way that's just one of those like crazy cool technologies to drill into and oh yeah then, and I, I i just love the fact that you know for all those system 32 modules it's just magic you don't you don't need to know like that it's wmi under the hood or that it's powershell or that it's net or that it's a native executable it just runs because it's just powershell right. Yeah, that's crazy. In fact, you know what? I had problems with that this morning. I was going to show an example. I decided not to. But I was like, oh, okay, so where's the scene? And it's like, wait, wait, wait oh, it's working. It's like, and then I found out, oh, well, what was happening was it was just working because underneath the covers, we automatically created that session. It's like, okay, so great for the user experience, bad when you're trying to find the scene to make a point. Anyway, and again, this is Microsoft and everyone uh, using this technology. And again, runs on bare metal runs in VMs, running in containers, runs anywhere. So again, that's our mission, manage anything, anywhere. Of course, we don't do VMS, but basically if there's some scenario that it doesn't help you manage and address, we really want to know about it because we think we're covering everything. You know, you can't swing a cat without finding something we're supporting. And then same thing with remoting, right? So we had WinRM, right? And uh, I don't even know if we told the story of the WinRM in the book, but there's some funny stories around that one. That was not our first choice, <laughs> let's say it that way. And so then when it, we went cross-platform and the world was all on, S, the rest of the world was on SSH, we were very thrilled to have the opportunity to add uh, SSH support uh, to that and the ability to access REST APIs, JSON. I don't know, am I missing something here? Joey, what's your favorite stuff? No, I mean, you know, it was it really, you know, the, the REST and JSON stuff, like, like some of this was always there to, to, to some extent, right? Like even SSH remoting, like, I mean, 15, 20 years ago, I was downloading crazy, probably insecure builds of SSH servers to run on Windows machines. But this just, again, it just brings it all together, makes it PowerShell native, updates everything for the, you know, the, the modern uh, kind of set of, of semantics, right? Like things like JSON getting parsed as UTF-16 in the old world, right? Yeah. Whereas, you know, the entire world has moved on to UTF-8 without a bomb, right? And now, you know, we, we just natively support that. So it's it's really just just jumping in line with all these other standards across all these other platforms and making sure that, you know, we just fit seamlessly, uh, going back to your seams, seamlessly in with the uh, the rest of the world. It's awesome. And it's one thing that, you know, kind of really get in focus here. Like, oh, hey, how much money, how much revenue, what were the sales of PowerShell last year? So you remember what the sales for PowerShell? Zero. What, what, how much, what were our revenues the year before that? Okay, so we've been investing in this for 20 years and our net revenue is zero, right? So what's that about? And the answer is, you know, we were, we were given a gift. We were given a gift. We were given the gift of having a mission to just go do whatever it takes to make our customers successful. Like, look, if customers, Satya said, look, if customers are being successful, you know, we'll be able to monetize that. If they're not successful, it's really hard to monetize. So we took the philosophy that said, hey, People want to use our products. They want to buy and use our products, but they're limited. They're rate limited in the amount that they can buy because it's so hard to get anything done. So, so it's that energy per answers, right? Like energy per answer, exactly. And so that's why we took on this, like, hey, let's make this super easy to do. And so that's why, you know, I don't know, Joey, how many people realize this, but this was the team that did the OpenSSH port to Windows. 
Because again, it's like, hey, there's this community and that community. Why do you have a Windows team and then a Linux team? Like that makes no sense. Why can't you all have just one tool? Why can't you do remoting from one environment to the other? So this team advocated it and did all the heavy, we did all the heavy lifting for .NET Core. We did all the heavy lifting to do some of the first open source uh, contributions and some of the first open source uh, software in Windows. So, and again, all because we're focused in on trying to make you successful. So anyway, I just love that mission. Really yeah, I can't, I can't wait for shell of an idea round two when I can tell some of the stories from, uh, you know, trying to get SSH shipped into Windows. Those were fun times. <laughs> Indeed. Awesome. So I uh, want to talk a little bit about these, these sort of principles of PowerShell 7, right? This idea, uh, you know, first of all, that you should work smarter, not harder, right? Less energy per answer, less energy per task you're trying to do. And one of the things that is just so valuable in terms of doing less work is the ecosystem and community of you know what's what's now over 8,000 modules shipping in the PowerShell gallery, right? So, you know, you, you can go out there with your duct tape and your WD-40, and you, you can go <laughs> rebuild, uh, you know, a module that's going to allow you to interface with Excel or uh, a module that's going to interface, you know, between secret management and uh, HashiCorp's vault, right? But with the PowerShell gallery, you could just hop in there and, uh, you know, not, not only download these things and leverage them in your own environment, obviously after you've done some, you know, sanity checks on whether that module is appropriate for your environment, but you can also contribute to these things, right? There's this entire community and ecosystem where in, in most, if, you know, the vast majority of cases, these modules are open source, they're on GitHub, people want pull requests, they want you to help fix these things, make them better, you know, make, make them work with, uh, you know, different environments and different sorts of customers, Windows and Linux. So, you know, you can get out there and just sort of, hop in and contribute to this this ecosystem so that people aren't duplicating efforts because you know i mean I, I don't know uh you know if you talked to folks jeffrey a lot about this this problem prior to the gallery but you know we, we would go out to our mvps and our customers and we'd find out that many of them were building the exact same modules inside of their own little enterprise silos exactly and over it, and over again and it's it just uh you know such such a waste of effort right yeah, and, you know, the other thing, Joey, is a lot of people will ask, oh, how do I get started in PowerShell? You know, oh, read PowerShell monthly lunches or, you know, watch some videos. But in reality, one of the best ways to do this is to go find some problem that you have, you know, find it on the gallery, and then look at the code. Look at the code. Like, hey, how, that's really cool. I can do this. How did they do that? And then you look at the code, and you're like, oh, that's really cool. Or, hey, that sucks. Why don't you try it this way? And then contribute back. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, I mean, I, I still learn this way today. I'm not out there writing a new module every time I need to accomplish something. I, I go to the gallery and I go, what can help me here? Right. Um, similarly, VS code extension, right? This is, this is really more about tooling in general, but you know, the VS code extension does so much stuff for you automatically now, right? One of my favorite things is just getting those little squigglies from script analyzer for best practices, right? Or, or throwing a snippet in there for an advanced function so that I don't have to, uh, you know, go, go out to find somebody's module in the gallery and copy paste little pieces or off a of stack overflow or whatever. Uh, I can, I can never remember, uh, you know, all the param syntax with the command line binding. It's, it's exactly been eight years now or whatever. And I still, I still can't remember what it is. So then Joey, um, some people in Twitter and such had thrown rocks saying, Oh, you know, it's, 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 you know, they tried it in the past and it was debug, it was buggy. And that when it really got slow, when you had large files, yeah, we've, we've addressed a lot of those problems. You know, there's there's some edge cases, I think, that still linger, and, and we're, we're looking to address those actually over the next couple months. But the vast majority of those issues, you know, we had a major switch over about a year and a half ago yeah. uh, from from a huge refactor of our, of our uh, extension, and a ton of those issues have been fixed. It was uh, much larger good. files work better. Debugging's a lot more stable. Um, you know, and even, you know, things like automatically updating, right? We're able to implement those in VS Code first where you get a little pop-up. Hey, you're out of date. Click this button and we'll we'll get your PowerShell right back up to where it needs to be. So all these sorts of things, you know, contribute to this sort of uh, uh, work smarter, not harder principle. Similarly, tab completion, IntelliSense, not just in the VS Code extension, but really anywhere you're using PowerShell, right? Even if I'm remoted into another machine, I've got all the power of IntelliSense right there in a quote-unquote dumb terminal uh, with control space, or as, as we'll see pretty soon, you know, things like predictive IntelliSense that just allow you to, uh, you know, not have to remember every little thing uh, about, you know, stuff you've done in the past or, or stuff that others have done as best practices. So uh, tab completion, I mean, I, I I couldn't use PowerShell without tab completion. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's funny, I don't know if you notice this, but every time you know, I'm using PowerShell and I'll just sort of stop and say, hey, what's going on here? Like when you're remoted into a system and you're able to do tab completion, and you're like, wait a second. So this isn't this isn't VT100, right? Where like the terminal's over there. The terminal's over here, and I'm able to do tab completion. And then you sit through like, wait, 
what had to happen for that to be true? And you just just shocking amount of hard work goes into these things that you luckily just don't even don't even notice. Exactly. Seamless. Seamless. And of course, uh, you know, just picking up PowerShell at all now is working smarter, not harder. Right. I don't have to go roll my own Docker file or container. We ship containers. I can just go out to the Docker hub and boom. I mean, I was just saying before I use the Alpine based PowerShell containers to, to do some stuff at home. And I don't, I don't have to do anything extra. It's, it's, it's one command. I pull this container. I tell it to run this one script inside of that container and you know, I'm all done. I've got, I've got my own little hosted infrastructure, uh, you know, and, and that thing, uh, you know, one little cron job and I'm pulling the latest version via that container package. Or if I'm even just in some CI platform using GitHub actions, Azure pipelines, there's a million third party CI platforms out there that pick up the latest version of PowerShell seven. And you know, you don't have to bring your own roll your own agent, whatever. You could just, you know, throw some script in a YAML file and, and uh, you're off to the races. And then Cloud Shell is available as a container, isn't it? Oh, Cloud Shell. Yes, absolutely. Cloud Shell is uh, uh, just awesome. Whether you're using the hosted version, this is Azure Cloud Shell and the Azure yeah. portal. But also, like you're saying, yeah, we've got a container image now for Azure Cloud Shell, which contains <laughs> a ton more of the tools uh, that are great for managing clouds that, that may not be there in the default uh, PowerShell image, as well as the .NET SDK we ship in now. So if you're out there developing oh. a .NET application, PowerShell's right there, just just uh, right next to all your .NET CLI tools. And and this is uh, PowerShell's rapidly becoming the language of choice, especially for cross-platform uh, .NET development for for you know testing and and uh, building, testing and deploying .NET applications. So cool, so cool. Very cool. So another uh, big principle here in PowerShell seven is transparency, right, and openness in general. So we really you know we set out when we first started this open source project to do open source you know quote unquote the right way. And I think having partners like Amazon, VMware, Google on day one uh, really demonstrated how committed we were to this. Um, but today, you know, the, the vast, vast majority, I mean, there are some extremely minor exceptions in terms of Microsoft compliance, but that vast majority of all the work that we do is tracked completely out in the open, right? They're, they're in issues, in pull requests out there in the open. We publish our design specs as, as review for comment documents, RFCs in the PowerShell RFC repo, and, and we open source pretty much everything by default, right? We, we don't ask ourselves, oh, is this something we should open source? Uh, we occasionally ask ourselves, is this something we can't open source for some arbitrary reason? But we're leaning into open source as the default, um, you know, and, and, and that means that really you get to peek under the hood at, at everything we're doing. And just like all those other gallery modules, you can see and contribute to, to what we're working on outside of PowerShell 7. Uh, we also do a monthly PowerShell community call. Uh, we have probably only missed two or three over the last uh, you know, three or four years that we've been doing these, uh, third Thursday of every single month, uh, you know, whether, whether I'm around or not, like, I think I'm going to be on vacation for the next one. They're still happening. Uh, you know, and, and that's, uh, you can find more info about that at AKMS PS community call, but that is generally the entire PowerShell engineering team shows up for that. Um, and, and lets you guys, you know, voice your opinions. Hey, what's going on with this thing? Or, you know, get the latest on what our releases, uh, you know, uh, are packed full of. Um, so just really an awesome opportunity to rec uh, connect directly with the team um, outside of the normal conference circuit. You know, people think they got to wait until these sorts of events in order yeah. to talk to us. And really, you know, every single month we're there and, and we want to hear what you guys are, are thinking. Yeah, exactly. So that was always one of the best, one of the reasons we love going to uh, conferences because there we could really find out, hey, this isn't working, et cetera. And, uh, you know, often you hear all the things that are working, great. But what really helps us is to find out where the problems are. That helps us prioritize. Uh, and so now we've got a great mechanism to do it every single month. So if something's not working, you have having heartburn, come tell us about it, please. Yes, please. And then finally, our telemetry. Um, you know, so we do collect a small amount of usage data uh, when you start PowerShell, and that helps us, uh, you know, drives insights into things like which platforms we should support, right? If we suddenly saw, uh, you know, a, a huge spike in, uh, you know, people trying to get it compiled on AIX or VMS or whatever, you know, maybe that would be a platform that we'd go and invest in. Uh, but, you know, we use this to say, hey, oh, uh, you know, maybe this distribution or that distribution is less popular. That's a place that we, you know, can, can prioritize away from our, our testing efforts. And so what we do here with, with uh, you know, the transparency is, A, you get to look right into our source code and find out what we're collecting, right? Everything is right there. There's no secret key logger. We're not looking at your scripts. We're not looking at your module names. There's things like very careful to have an allow list of module names. You know, if you load a module, oh, we want to count that so we know that you're using, say, Azure PowerShell. But if your module is not in that allow list, right, if you have your uh, my company name dot management, there's no way we're getting a hold of that, right? And you can see that right in the source code that, uh, that that's what's happening. And of course, we publish that data. So 
Uh, if you go to AKMS slash PS GitHub BI, you could see exactly what we know, you know, what data we're, we're tracking and, and how we're using that to, to drive decisions in the product. Yeah, you know, a lot of people were concerned about that whole telemetry thing. And, and I think the team just did a fantastic job about being super clear about why we're collecting the data. Collect the data so that we can serve you better. Full stop. Again, we're not making revenue. We're not selling ads, et cetera. And then here is the data. You know, you have the source code so you can see exactly what we're picking up. And the telemetry, the, that's what we're looking at. So you can see it too. So being completely forthright, I think, really helps stem some of the concerns about what's going on here. So you guys played that really well. Thanks, Jeff. All right, PowerShell 7.1. So we really released this in uh, November of uh, 21, 2020, and uh, that's supported for about a year, okay, for, yeah, uh, from release. Um, this was built upon .NET version 5, um, and that's uh, and it's everywhere, right? And so one of the great things about this version is now you can go to the store. So I don't you've tried that. You go to the Windows Store and type PowerShell, and you can now download it from the Windows Store. We started you that with uh, 7.1, so crazy cool stuff. And 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 really, this is the case we talk about it here in 7.1, but really it was in uh, 6.0, and in just the whole open source effort is just we have so many community contributions. I got to tell you, it's the thing I love the most about PowerShell. I think it's one of the most transformative things. Open it up to the community. There were always this like edge edge feature, like oh, it should do this, but we're busy doing that. Oh, I really should do this. Oh, but we got to go do this. And the community was able to come in and and provide just a ton of small, medium, and large features that just flush it out in ways that really matter to the community. So I just, it's again, one of my favorite features. Uh, and then this is where we start first introducing the intelligent, uh, you know, in, predictive IntelliSense. And I think we're gonna talk some more about that a little bit later. So let's talk about the telemetry. Yeah, so this is a really uh, interesting pair of graphs here. Uh, so on the left side, we're actually, and, and this is, uh, you know, the, the telemetry you see up on PS GitHub BI includes both the PowerShell Core 6 and the PowerShell 7 data. Um, we have started to uh, summarize some of this more historically so that we've got a little longer term horizon, uh, but but that's really only for the PowerShell 7 data, right? So what you're seeing here is purely purely PowerShell 7 and why there might be a little mismatch with the data that you see um, out in the public. Uh, but, but on the left side, we have sort of unique nodes of PowerShell, right? So you can think of these as individual machines, VMs, containers, uh, basically unique systems that may run a number of different sessions. And on the right side, we have the PowerShell uh, sessions, right? So this is every time you start up a PowerShell, a pwsh.exe instance, you know, we add a little plus one to this graph. So what's really interesting here is that, um, you know, we, we had Linux dominant usage uh, f in terms of our sessions on the right side uh, for a very long time. And recently uh, we, we crossed over the threshold where, you know, now you're seeing about 50% of usage coming from Windows. Um, and I think some of the reason for this is, as Jeffrey was saying, a lot of the stuff that you could do with, uh, you know, Windows PowerShell 5.1, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a lot that got added there for PowerShell Core 6 and for, for, for Windows users. So, you know, people were saying, well, Windows PowerShell is working fine for me. Uh, you know, I don't really see a, a need to upgrade yet. And as, as PowerShell 7 has sort of matured uh, and brought back a lot of that compatibility, I think you see a lot of people recognizing that the additional value that's there in PowerShell 7 is worth it now that they know they don't have to take a step backwards, uh, you know, from where they were with Windows PowerShell. So, you know, I think this just really points to the fact that uh, you know, the, the maturity is caught up and that the Windows user base is really, uh, you know, uh, embracing PowerShell 7. Um, but on the left side, you see the overwhelming majority of these machines are uh, Linux nodes, right? So uh, this points to the fact that I think that the Linux world has uh, rapidly embraced containerization. Uh, you know, you have a lot more ephemeral machines. Machines get torn down much quicker, uh, whereas Windows machines tend to be, you know, either longer running bare metal machines or VMs. Uh, those machines, you know, have a longer life cycle potentially, uh, and so multiple, you know, sessions are getting run within the same node. Uh, could also be a lot of dev boxes, a lot of, uh, you know, individual user machines where they're starting up a lot of their own sessions. So, um, you know, it's just interesting to sort of see this trend uh, play out between OSs. But, you know, we have a number of really interesting facts. Uh, over 50% of PowerShell 7 sessions are running in Docker, right, which really points to how powerful it is that we have these container images available for folks. Um, as we said, Windows just caught up to and barely surpassed Linux sessions, but Windows still represents less than 10% of the nodes, right? So people are running, you know, five, five to 20 sessions on, a, on an individual Windows node, uh, whereas, you know, they may just spin up a Linux machine to just run a workload and then, you know, get rid of that thing. 
Yeah, it's amazing. The, the things, you know, we collect a bunch of data, but there's a bunch of data that we don't have. And so often we're like, wow, that number on Linux yes. is so huge. Who's doing what with that thing? And then, of course, we don't collect that information, so we don't know. But Joey, I was wondering, when people get, uh, you know, fully uh, get their COVID vaccines, will we be able to ask Bill Gates what those people are doing? I I don't believe so, Jeffrey. I'm not, I'm not privy to that sort of information, but as far as I know, the, doesn't everybody uh, get a microchip now with the with the vaccine? Never the, mind. Uh, the the five G and the uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, no, I mean we we would love to have that information. And please, if you are one of those users who are the millions and millions of Linux sessions that we see, uh, you know, spike up and down occasionally. Please let us know because we'd love to do things for you that you need us to do. Um, but uh, no, we we would uh, myself, Jeffrey, the entire team, every one of my managers, they would all love to know, you know, what these workloads are. But we really don't know. Um, so uh, and and that's uh, you know for for the sake of your privacy. So um, another really interesting fact here: twenty five percent, roughly, of, of PowerShell seven users are already on seven one, which is awesome, given that we only just shipped that at the beginning of this year. Really wow. tells us that folks are you know, able to move forward. We're really excited to see how 7.2 uh, plays out in terms of the sort of adoption curve there, given that it's going to be an LTS. Uh, about 25% of PowerShell 7 sessions load Azure PowerShell. So this is just really, really interesting that, you know, we, we did expect, you know, a, a lot of folks to be doing cloud management. PowerShell 7, I think, has really been adopted as a tool for cloud management. We can't know because of that allow list how many folks are using AWS tools or VMware tools or Google tools, but it's probably a good amount. But interestingly, um, there's a pretty significant chunk. Unfortunately, I don't have this exact number. It's it's probably in the 10 to 20% as well. But there's a lot of folks that don't use any modules beyond what is built into PowerShell, which tells us that PowerShell is is really useful uh, just as a scripting and orchestration language for, you know, like like we said, .NET applications, potentially you're building, uh, testing, deploying uh, uh, .NET applications using native utilities, right? I, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to write a Bash script that was longer than 30 or 40 lines. I, I love Bash, we used it for years. Uh, but when it comes to robust scripting capabilities, uh, you know, it, it can be a lot more challenging to manage, you know, complex control flow, even just executing native applications. Um, so that's really something that, uh, yeah, I, I, I found fascinating. Um, and then with the VS Code extension, um, about 50% of users are still on Windows PowerShell, uh, which is both an awesome, you know, it, it, on, one, on the one hand, you know, it can seem a little disappointing, like, oh, we really want users moving up to PowerShell 7. But on the other hand, it tells us that there's so much value in the VS Code extension that even folks that still use Windows PowerShell have moved away from the ISC and are embracing the VS Code extension. So, yeah. you know, just because you're maybe not a PowerShell 7 fan today doesn't mean that you can't use the VS Code extension and gain a lot of value out of that. Yeah. Um, similarly, you know, if we if we just back up really quick to this original slide, you'll notice that Mac OS is in the legend here, um, and yet it's virtually imperceptible in, in the graph, right? Good point. So, so why is that? Well, generally, Mac OS is not running uh, servers, right? Uh, you know, you, you don't have uh, really at scale cloud workloads where you're deploying tons of machines, uh, you know, from a Mac OS box or you're running your Mac OS CI. And so, you know, you don't see that at scale automation. But when I go to a conference, PowerShell Summit, generally, if I look around, about half the machines have an Apple logo on them, right? Which means that Mac OS is still a critical authoring environment, right, for, for developers and DevOps and IT professionals to author their scripts and deploy them up to the cloud. And that's why, coming back to these statistics, when we look at VS Code, right, about 13% of users uh, are Mac OS users using the VS Code extension, which would absolutely show up on that other graph. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really, uh, yeah, just another, another, another way that we uh, maintain our commitment to Mac OS, despite the fact that if we just looked at the node and session telemetry, we might say this platform isn't important enough uh, for us to invest in. So really quick, you know, PowerShell 7.2, it's already cranking. We're already on preview four, possibly even preview five by the time you're watching this recording. Uh, it's tentatively scheduled for the end of this year. We are right there with .NET now. Uh, and so, you know, we, we shipped uh, within 24 hours of, of their last release, and we plan to do the same, maybe even, uh, you know, within six hours uh, of the .NET 6 release that, that this is built on top of. Yeah, it's um, really so a little behind-the-scene baseball on that. It used to be they'd release, and then we would – how long would it take us, like six weeks, four three, weeks? Three eh, – like sometimes three months, four months. Oh, I yeah. mean, it could – you know, it, it was dependent on – you know, we, we'd sort of work back and go, oh, maybe they, they made this change in the uh, late days, and so we got to match that change with more changes. And, um, yeah, we are we are so, so, so partnered with them now. Yeah, and so what do we do to get it so, so we can be so uh, agile? We just we, we we speak more often. We're we're pulling preview builds on a on a more uh, uh, consistent basis. We've got some automation that's that's doing its best to to keep up with with their uh, established builds and to test some of their nightlies. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we, we just work hand in hand in feeding some of our requirements into them, making sure that, uh, you know, they, they test us to some extent by virtue of the fact that they're pulling into their PS core SDK container or their, their .NET SDK, SDK container. Uh, exactly. so, you know, all of us are testing each other's bits with each other. Yeah. And that allows us to be highly confident when we come out after two release candidates to say, Hey, on this day, we're all going to just release together. And, and what that does, uh, you know, it, it's not just nice for people that like to get the latest bits, but it also means that we're maximizing the amount of time that you are in a supported uh, build, right? So, exactly. so if we ship the same day, that three years that .NET guarantees for an LTS, uh, you're going to get every day of those three years using PowerShell 7.2, which exactly. is, is going to be an LTS as well. And again, this is one of the things I love about the team. The team is willing to go do these hard, dirty, tough engineering tasks. Yeah, that was not easy. Yeah. And and there's no glory, like, oh, you know, no celebration. Oh, it's like, but it delivers customer value. And again, that's what I just love about the team, just so focused in on customer value. So Yeah, we turn over to Richard Lander on the .NET team and give him a high five. And that's, you know, that's our glory right there. But that's, that's enough for me. His, uh, his high fives are worth a lot. Uh, so, you know, the, the release here, we're really focused again on shell improvements. A lot of this predictive intelligence stuff, we're going to show stability. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the innovation that we're doing is actually happening outside of PowerShell. And this is really a theme uh, across the organization uh, for the, you know, our GitHub organization across the PowerShell team um, is that, you know, we really got to make sure that this platform is stable. Right, it's been out for a long time. The usage is in the you know, hundred million a month sessions. This is not something that we can just break on people. Um, and what that means is, you know, we we really are looking to do a lot of the new shiny stuff outside of PowerShell and new modules. These may find their way into PowerShell, but we want to make sure that we stabilize them and that uh, you know things are working good. People like these modules and that they really have high enough value to belong in PowerShell. So, the age-old question I get asked it. More than any. Hey other Joey, <laughs> what about shipping in Windows? <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, what about shipping in Windows? Well, we still have some support challenges, right? And .NET, given that .NET supports their LTS for about three years, we we can't ship it in Windows and and uh, you know adhere to the Windows support lifecycle of five years plus five years extended plus however long we're going with 2008 R2 on Azure. Um, you know these are. Uh, these are strong commitments that we make when we say that we support a thing in an operating system. We support that major version uh, in perpetuity for the remainder of that life cycle. And, you know, that's not something that we can kind of bend the rules on. Um, but we're going to make it easier than ever for you to pick it up, regardless of what version of Windows you're on. And in fact, in my opinion, decoupling the version of PowerShell from the version of Windows allows you to be able to stay more up to date on older versions of Windows where, uh, you know, if, if we were shipping in the operating system, you may be sort of stuck on, you know, a potentially older build. So here, by shipping in the download catalog, we have servicing via Microsoft Update. This is, uh, if you've ever used Windows Update, there's a little checkbox in your advanced settings that allows you to uh, allow updates for other Microsoft products from Windows Update. And, you know, if you've got PowerShell 7 installed, that box is going to give you all the latest updates from PowerShell 7 right there in your Windows Update workflow. But this also means by shipping in the download catalog, that we're compatible with all the download catalog tooling. So that means SCCM, Intune, WSUS. We know tons of you are still using these things on-prem. Um, and, and there's lots of other third-party tooling that integrates directly with the download catalog. So we do believe by casting a wide net here, making it simpler to simply, you know, check a box, have PowerShell, you know, rev my compliance, make sure it's up to date, run my Windows update, that, that you can just have the latest version of PowerShell um, and, and be confident that, uh, you know, you're, you're not on some older version that maybe was baked into, you know, three years ago version of the OS that you're still on. Indeed. So also talking about uh, working groups a little bit. So this is a concept. These are essentially subcommittees within open source where, um, you know, we uh, want to make decisions uh, in issues and pull requests. So, um, you know, going into the implementation of these things, we, we had a few goals. We recognized we were having some challenges in the open source project. One of those is that we weren't scaling well in terms of our issue and pull request triage, right? Even if you pop open GitHub right now, we have a lot of open pull requests and a lot of issues. And a lot of these are not, you know, being actively uh, sort of communicated, right? We're not, we're not reviewing every single one of these pull requests right this second or these, these issues. And they come in and maybe, you know, community members have some conversations about those uh, without any of the PowerShell team members around. So we really wanted a way to scale this better. I also wanted to accelerate the decision-making process. You know, we found that we were taking a very long time, even once these things were triaged, to actually make a final call on it and say, hey, this is going to come in or this is, you know, not going to be able to come in. Um, and then we're also noticing that a lot of this, you know, uh, uh, sort of holdup was due to the bottleneck of the PowerShell committee, right? So we meet for a couple hours every single week. We talk about a lot of these things, and many of us, you know, have other responsibilities in our day jobs. 
Uh, and so because of that, um, you know, we found ourselves being kind of the bottleneck and the slowdown for this decision making. And we wanted to delegate some of our authority out to other people so that we could unblock some of these things that were coming in. So the overall flow of this new working group process where we've got these subcommittees is at a very high level. This is, uh, you know, a little more complex under the hood, but a very high level. Can it be done outside of PowerShell? Right. If yes, if you can go build a module today that's going to support this functionality, whoop, you should go build it. Right. And if it's really awesome and everyone loves it and, you know, it really just needs to be in the image because even before I load PowerShell get, I need this thing to be there for these bootstrap scenarios, then you can propose at that point, hey, I want to bring this into PowerShell. But until then, go build it outside of PowerShell. Maybe we can contribute. Maybe we'll use it. Um, but, but, you know, we really don't want to add additional surface area to PowerShell itself, which is already a fairly large package and is, you know, very expensive for us to maintain. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, how we actually want to go the opposite direction. You know, I, I yes. used to say this, and we were doing the refactoring of Windows for Nano Server. And the, like the, the best operating system in the world has only one function, and that is load optional component, right? If you want to remove an optional component, you got to load that first, right? But anyway, that, that is the smallest thing, and then you bring in only the things you need. So indeed, we want to push more and more things out of PowerShell. Absolutely. So after that, after we've gotten a, you know, a no to that question, this thing can only, it's a language feature in PowerShell. We can only do it in PowerShell. Then, you know, we've got a series of, of heuristics that we use here, right? Um, and, and obviously, you know, you can answer no to some of these um, and, and still potentially make it in. But generally speaking, a yes to each of these questions is going to contribute to more success. So those questions are, is this a valuable thing, right? Is it, is it useful in the real world? Is this actually going to reduce the energy per answer for people um, in, in real world scenarios? Is it non-breaking, right? Is, is uh, you know, maybe this is a great feature that we should have done from day one, but if every script out there in the world is gonna be broken as a result of this change, that's probably not something that we can do because we're committed to the stability of the platform over the long haul. Does it have a large audience, right? Is this, this might be very, very valuable for you, but if it's not valuable for anybody else, well, then it's probably not something that we wanna contribute to the surface area. And is it a trivial change, right? If, if this is, Oh man, this makes so much sense. It's one new parameter. Yeah, we should have had this on day one. No problem. Go ahead and ship it in, right? Those, all those yeses are going to contribute to more success. But in some cases where those things are non-trivial, maybe there are some breaking changes or some different design implications that need to be discussed by the committee or in a larger forum. Um, we're going to push, uh, you know, hey, write an RFC, write one of these design specifications, and then also ship as an experimental for feature first, right? So what's an experimental feature? Basically, it means that we uh, fence, you know, that new code, uh, we turn it on by default in preview builds and then off by default in stable builds, right? So we introduce a feature. If you're one of those people out there using previews, you know that occasionally things might break for you. Um, and if we get a lot of reports of those breakages or people say this feature doesn't work like I expected it to, then we can revise it or we can choose to remove it all together, right? Uh, and, and that really allows us to experiment and play with these new features without necessarily committing to the idea that they're definitely going to be in PowerShell after that RFC gets written. And that works out really well. A lot of times, you, you know, we talk about these things and it's like, uh, but then when you actually code it, right, and you like use it, you're like, ah, I see. Yeah, like that's really valuable or really valuable if or, yeah, not so much. Yeah, and you see this in the open source project. People, uh, you know, will sort of wax poetic about all the sort of theoretical implications of a potential change. But at the end of the day, when you code it up and you try it, you go, oh, well, that didn't do what I thought it was going to do. Oh, no, you can't do that. Uh, let's try a different way, right? And, and that is so much more useful and gets to that sort of conclusion so much faster, uh, which is why we, we really push for that experimentation. So we plan to be reaching out to some top contributors soon because while these working groups today are comprised entirely of folks on the PowerShell team, the goal here is to scale out, not just to, you know, rearrange the amount of work that we're doing. Um, and so we really want to engage with those people that are experts in certain areas in PowerShell and, you know, help uh, sort of deputize them uh, as people that can help make some of these decisions for us. Yeah, you know, it's, you know, the way I kind of view this, Joey, I was thinking about this earlier this morning, is that whether it was open source, whether it was, you know, putting things in modules, whether it's refactoring this, whether it's refactoring the way we, we work with the community, step by step, we're just, it's like adding more lanes to the highway. And, and that's the trick, right? How do we keep, you know, allow more things to get done safely um, instead of just having a yeah. single thread? Right, right, yeah. Parallelization is a powerful uh, uh, multiplier. Indeed. All right, so I want to talk about PSARM. I love this thing. So I don't know how many of you have used ARM templates, but when they first came out, I looked at them and I was like, 
hey, Mark, that's pretty freaking ugly. Uh, would you like us to help you? And he's like, what are you talking about? It's beautiful. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so and I just looked at it. I was like, oh, man, that's horrible. Um, and I, I called this baby ugly, unfortunately. And anyway, so, uh, so then sort of years went by. He didn't think that was a good idea. And then at some point, guess what? The community's like, hey, you know what? This thing's kind of ugly. And so we started a project on something we call BICEP. And that sort of opened us up uh, to doing PS Arm. Because we said, yeah, you know, hey, bicep is another flavor of a purely declarative approach to doing a, a an ARM template. But, uh, well, two things. One is I just disagree with that approach. I believe at the end of the day, all these declarative things, they all say, oh, purely declarative. Uh, and in the end, you end up with imperative code. And actually, if you take a look at the ARM templates, there's little islands of imperative code in there. Uh, and I just believe that PowerShell with our domain-specific languages has done a pretty good job of integrating imperative and declarative code. Uh, I think it's just the right model. The second thing was, you know, we originally were going to do this a while ago. It was just sort of like, no, let's just do it. And uh, I, frankly, I, a number of us, were under the mistaken idea that we had to make core changes to our language engine to do better support uh, domain-specific languages. And then Rob Holt uh, and Steve uh, uh, Lee came about with an insight and said, no, actually, you don't. If we did this, this, and this, this becomes, it goes from an extra large prop uh, thing with high risk of breaking things to a relatively small task with a very low thing. So, you know, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Steve. Remember I said, Mike? The thing I'm proudest of is creating an environment where geniuses can add their genius. That's what they did, man. They added their genius in a way that is coherent. So that's what the PS Arm is. Uh, it is. Do you want to take take control here? Just make sure I. Uh, oh, I thought I did. Yeah. No, oh, sorry. I'm advancing it for myself. That is not helping you, is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it is an, a, a mixture of imperative and declarative code, right? So you get loops, you get pipelines, you get conditionals. Instead of having a literal, you can look something up in SQL. You can look something up in AD. You can talk to VMware, ask them their opinion about things, you know, whatever you want. You get the code from wherever it is, uh, construct it however you want to, and then, but it's also then declarative, right? Um, <clears throat> and ultimately then renders into an ARM template. So it's very similar to Terraform or to Bicep. And I want to be clear here, you know, use the tool that makes you successful, right? Again, we're not after your revenue. We don't get any revenue for PowerShell. Whatever tool makes you successful, people are often like, oh, why should I use PowerShell over this? I'm already being successful with that. It's like, go with God. You know, if you're being successful, that's happy days. Uh, I think that we have an opportunity to do a better job. And so I think you ought to consider this. And a lot of things we will call our sacred vow. We do them because of our sacred vow, which is a lot of you have invested in learning PowerShell. And if you want to go invest and learn a new tool, that's great, <clears throat> but that tool, everything you spent, all the time you spend on that new tool doesn't help you with your PowerShell. Uh, any advances we make in PowerShell doesn't help you with that new tool. So we were really very cognizant of this like broken ecosystem problem. That's why we invest in the sacred vow. So if you want to leverage your PowerShell skills and, and get some great uh, stuff to it. So again, it, uh, again as we improve PowerShell, you get benefits of this. So again, you have Bicep, you have Terraform, happy days. How do they handle secrets? Uh, yeah, that's that's going to be a problem. Well, guess what? PowerShell, we got secrets management. Use PSARM, just use secrets management to go grab those secrets and plug them in here. Um, so that, that's the benefit of the approach we're taking. Now, here's an example. Looks a little complicated, right? So the idea here is that this is a function. And at the bottom, you'll see there's a new commandlet, publish PSARM template. And you give it a script, okay, in the script, new storage. And then there's a new extension extension, right? So it's, it's got to be .psarm.ps1. So it's a PowerShell script, but you put that PSARM in there to tell us it's a PSARM script, okay? <clears throat> and then you give it a set of parameters. Now here, then how do you write these things? And the answer is PowerShell, right? It's PowerShell, okay? So uh, this is a function. It has a set of parameters. Those parameters you can say are mandatory, not mandatory, default values, et cetera, anything you want. It's a PowerShell function. But then you have this domain-specific language, right? ARM. And what does it take? It takes a script block, a script block. Oh, you mean code? Yeah, code, okay? So ARM and this thing. And now notice it says for each. So wait, so now I've got imperative code. So if start off declarative arm, and then I have imperative code for each dollar log in location. And then what? Another declarative function, resource, 
storage name, blah, 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 and then what ARM SKU you want, and then what the properties are. And then, you know, we'll have IntelliSense that supports all this, so you can auto-predict these things, et cetera. But if you look at it, it's pretty clear to understand, nice declarative. <clears throat> You'll see same, similar things in, in the other tools, et cetera. The difference is here is that for each, right? Uh, you know, you can put conditionals in here. You can look information up from wherever you want. And so we think that this mixture of imperative and imper imperative by the way, so what's happening here is you're creating storage accounts in multiple locations. So what I did at the bottom here is I said, hey, I want a new storage account uh, in locations U.S. West and U.S. East. So it's going to create two. And so you'll see how with fairly pithy code uh, and imperative loops, conditionals, et cetera, you can get very rich and complex uh, ARM templates. So I'm just, just thrilled about this work. And again, hats off to the geniuses, Rob and Steve, and the others that contributed for that kind of keen insight that allowed us to, to go implement this. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I, I would caveat to people, you know, yes, if you run that, some things will happen that, uh, you know, are, are, you know, you get some errors and stuff. There's, you know, missing a name that's a mandatory parameter and stuff like that. But okay. we're just trying to demonstrate the, uh, you know, what, what's going on there. If you go out to the PSR repository today on the PowerShell GitHub repo, uh, Rob and, and Danny Martins have written a number of awesome examples uh, that are both very long and very short uh, that will demonstrate all kinds of different scenarios to how to use PSR. So definitely check that out. Um, so here we're talking about predictive IntelliSense a little bit. I'm just going to barely tease this one because uh, there is an awesome session from Jason Helmick and Damian Caro going way into detail with this, but we just are so excited about this, we couldn't help ourselves to, to show a little bit here. But basically, predictive IntelliSense is tab completion that knows what you want to type before you type it, right? So if you look here at this picture, all that's actually been typed by the user is get-ch, right? The entire rest of that command has been pulled from a predictive plugin uh, that suggests this command to you. And if I were to hit the right arrow or whatever key, keyboard shortcut you have it configured as, I'm just going to get the whole rest of that command. So it's like tab completion on a single token, but for the entire command string, which is just way cool. Um, now, you know, there's a number of these different prediction plugins. Uh, today, you know, we have history built right in. Um, so if, you know, if you, you see here, uh, you know, this is actually coming directly out of my PS readline history file. If you get dash PS readline option, you can see where that's stored. Uh, people even go put it in their OneDrive so that it syncs up uh, across multiple machines and they have a single shared history. Some people don't want that. You can set it up however you want. Um, but it, it's actually going to go into your history similar to how Control R would search through your history. But I, I've got a list view here that actually shows me, hey, these are all of the things that match what you're currently typing. And, you know, I can use, uh, you know, arrow keys to select which one of those I want to use. And so, you know, when I use three or four things that start with the same few letters, but I, I do those three or four th different things all the time. Uh, this is this is awesome for that. And, you know, I've been using this, and then Jason had pointed out, like, uh, you know, I was going back, and you, know, you select something, and then you can go back and modify things. And it, Jason's like, why are you doing it that way? There's all these nice accelerators to switch between the arguments of the command line uh, oh, to modify things. It's well worth taking a few minutes to learn this. It's so cool. And go through their sessions because it's, uh, you know, there are so many little features and, and awesome little tidbits of this. Uh, but, you know, si similarly, um, we've got this Azure PowerShell plugin, right? And this is uh, where Damien Caro comes in. And, and this is just way cool that Azure uh, has built this machine learning module that actually is able to suggest best practice uh, Azure PowerShell commands uh, based on documentation, stack overflow examples, a whole, a whole gamut of, of data sources that they've used here. Um, to uh, uh, or Stack Overflow type, I don't know if it was actually in the data set or whatever, but um, but the uh, uh, some kind of examples, but but we've pulled from all over the place, and and so you've got these these commands here um, that will suggest to you like like hey I'm, I I see that you're uh, you know you're wanting to do a new AZ VM, these are the parameters that you should use, and here's some dummy values for the parameter values and that sort of thing. Um, we're even looking into like hey you use a subscription ID up there, we're going to auto fill that subscription ID on your next suggestion for your next command because you're probably still using the same subscription ID as you go through. Just way, way cool, you know, uh, you know work smarter, not harder kind of stuff. So definitely check out az.predictor in, in their session. So this was a little secret one that we were talking about. Jeffrey, do you want to you hop in on this one? 
Yeah, sure. So this is minimal PowerShell. So I kind of uh, uh, mentioned that earlier. And the idea, again, was this idea that, uh, you know, the best operating system or the best PowerShell is one that has exactly one function, load optional component. Uh, and the reason for that is that, uh, you know, it allows us to go into an environments that are very, very small. So think Raspberry Pi, think HoloLens, think, you know, there's lots of scenarios that we've been public about, lots of scenarios that we haven't been public about where they need to say, hey, space is at a premium. And if I'm not using it for my scenario, I don't want it to be part of the system. And so that's the idea here. And then we won't get to the point where it's, you know, load optional package is the only thing that's a starting block. But we do want to make it as small as possible. And the idea here is to then take these various subsystems and to decouple them. You know, <clears throat> break out the utility commandlets, break out PS read line, break out the help, break out remoting. One of the ideas was, hey, you know, right now you have remoting and you get all the remoting, SSH, WinRM, et cetera. But what if I don't, you know, if I've fully converted over to SSH, why am I still loading all that WinRM code? And the idea is like, hey, can we break that into subsystems? Again, with the idea that says, I bring in only the things that I want to, and then pick up everything else through the gallery. Back to this idea of, adding more swim lanes, right, or lanes to the highway, as it were, the degree to which I have to make a change in remoting and I have to change it in the mainline PowerShell means that you got to coordinate with the PowerShell team, you got to have, you know, sync everything up, et cetera. Uh, why not just say, hey, let's create a new swim lane for remoting and just go as fast as the wind. Uh, and so that's what this allows us to do. And, and again, this does not necessarily mean that you get an overly complex environment. If you think about the, the AZ module, right, you say import module AZ, and because we have nested modules, that AZ module is in fact uh, an umbrella module that then says bring in all these other things. And so for you, you just say get AZ module and then a little bit later you've got all the other modules. Uh, so the same idea will be, hey, whether it's we pre-configured a container or we pre-configure a module, uh, you'll then import something that'll bring in your most commonly used subsets. So that's where we're going with uh, minimal sub sub minimal PowerShell. Yeah, just to clarify a little bit, Jeffrey, you know, this yeah. is uh, this is something that a, you know, very, very early days. We're still figuring out how this is going to work. One of the things that we've started on here is the uh, remoting transport uh, pluggability. So there's been folks out there that have wanted to plug in uh, other remoting subsystems beyond WinRM and SSH. So, you know, it's not just expanding the number of lanes for the PowerShell team to operate in, but for the entire community to operate in so that, you know, things that maybe were, uh, you know, less uh, willing to merge into the official PowerShell branch can still get plugged in just the same as any other low-level component. But also I want to point out that this is, not something where we're going to go and get rid of the traditional PowerShell package, right? We know that there are folks out there that need the kitchen sink. We're committed to the stability. This is really something that is going to be in addition to what you see today. Um, and, you know, we still see a lot of value in having that sort of all in one package. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so again, PowerShell version 7. You can, Hopefully you've seen through the, the conversation today, it really is about managing everything everywhere, right? And, and this is really about empowering every person and organization in the world to achieve more, whether you're Windows, whether you're a VMS customer, whether you're on-prem, whether you're cloud, you like Azure, oh, I like a a a AWS, oh, I like Google. Uh, whatever it is, we want to help you be successful. That's it. We want to help you be successful. Um, and again, that's why we have these, you know, uh, PowerShell community calls. If there's something that we're doing that we're missing, we definitely want to hear from you. Uh, we think we're doing all the right things, but always open to hearing where we can do better. Uh, we can, t because why? Are we there yet? Again, we think that we've given you stuff and you can do anything with what we've given you, right? We're Turing complete. Um, but Back to this energy for, per answer. How can we make it so that your life is easier, that you can do things one step instead of two with more simplicity, with better uh, supportability? How can we help you be the hero of your company? How can we help you develop tools to provide other people power and, and uh, uh, simplicity? Uh, so that's where we're, we're going with this. So we got a bunch of great sessions here today. I uh, encourage you to go to all these. We talked about the one, uh, but we've got secrets management with Paul and Sydney. Uh, we're going to do the how to do a pull request, uh, you know, going from a pull request to a release. Uh, we'll talk about Crescendo. Is that the name? Yeah, Crescendo, where we're able to take PowerShell and native wrap native commandlets to give high-level task-oriented abstractions to native executables. Uh, and then how to get from PowerShell API from .NET, um, NuGet APIs from PowerShell GET, 
read line, predictive IntelliSense, dynamic help, awesome stuff, and then desired state configuration. So lots of great sessions here today. And with that, I think we have some time for some questions. So now we will we will cut to uh, you know us now in the future where uh, yeah we're, we can't wait to answer your questions so uh, you know and, and obviously after we're done with that have, have a great session uh, or summit everyone uh, we're really really looking forward to attending all the many of these other sessions uh, and uh, just really excited for an awesome conference so thanks everybody.